Shelton with the Kellogg Company. I'm responsible for global facility management and capital planning. Uh, prior to that, I had 20 years with a Fortune 50 company where I was uh, responsible for real estate, facility management, and construction, and uh, heavily involved in capital planning. Yep. So, Kevin, I mean, we, we know this is such a timely topic um, for facilities management professionals. As, as some of us were really just um, finishing up this process in submitting budgets in late August, September, some of us are right in the middle of it now. So, I think it's pretty timely. Uh, people are, are maybe feeling the pain and. And what we want to do um, is kind of share, again, those best practices to, to help ease that pain. But, uh, Kevin, I didn't tell you this, but I always like to start these with a joke uh, because, I, because I, think, <laughs> I think it sets the stage. So I don't know if you've heard this or, or maybe in your former life you've dealt with anyone like this, but uh, CFOs sometimes can be challenging uh, to work with. So there's, there's this one I've heard about. Um, the CFO was calling to make a dental appointment, okay, and calls the dentist and says that I need to – schedule an appointment to have a tooth removed. And he tells the dentist, well, before uh, I schedule this appointment with you, I need to know the cost. And the dentist says, well, my tooth removal cost is like $750. And the CFO says, well, doc, that's steep. That is steep. I'm not going to pay that much to have a tooth removed. Um, so I'll tell you what, what if you do this with um, my tools? I know your tools are very expensive. I'll go out. I've got a nice toolbox in the garage. Um, I'll bring my own pliers. You don't have to use any of your equipment. What could you do that for? And the dentist says, well, if I don't have to use my tools, uh, I could probably do it for $500. And the CFO says, well, that's better. Uh, it's a lot better, but it's still a lot more than I'm looking to spend on this procedure. And so the CFO says, oh, um, what if you don't use any pain medication? I mean, no Tylenol, numbing gas, laughing gas, any of that. Um, and the dentist says, well, sir, you want to use your own tools, none of my high-end dental equipment, no pain medication whatsoever. Um, I guess I could do that for like $200. And the CFO says, you've got a deal. I'd like to schedule an appointment for my wife next Tuesday. So, <laughs> so it's kind of, kind of challenging. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes these financial people don't understand the pain that we're going through, right, as facilities management executives um, and, and planners. So really what I think we need to do is provide them with information of why they're causing us um, so much pain. So when developing an asset management plan, I mean, we want to help to develop uh, and provide that level of information that, that's needed. So short, long-term expenses, replacement plans, uh, how types of things uh, as it pertains to maintenance performance, energy efficiency, cost reduction improvements, uh, and ultimately we want to develop executable plans, not just a list of, of projects and um, uh, not a not a real thought out list of, of recommendations and Kevin in our planning this is a lot of what we've talked about and kind of one of the reasons that I think it's so challenging uh, right now is, is our portfolios aren't um, aren't simple right we talked a lot about this we're this is a, a typical corporate manufacturing complex I and mean, we've got north of 30 buildings on this complex probably 300 to 400 roof systems uh, that the professionals responsible for this um, are also responsible for the mechanical, the electrical, the plumbing. So it's not simple. Uh, the, these things are very, very complex, what we're, what we're all responsible for managing, whether it's a manufacturing facility, high-end corporate facility, healthcare, or, or hos hospital. And I think that's really where an asset management program or a plan comes in. It's going to help you to, um, it's a tool that's going to help provide a holistic view of the organization's facility assets, their overall conditions, uh, locations, when they'll need maintenance replacement, so it's going to help bring clarity to, to that whole picture. So I guess, Kevin, a, a question I have for you is, uh, why is an asset management program important from your perspective? Well, from the perspective of budgeting, uh, you really have to know what your assets are and have a pretty comprehensive list of them. Uh, if you don't have that, you can talk to your financial person, and typically they can pull an asset list off of uh, their depreciation schedule you just have to filter out the non-facilities related uh, items. But then at least it gives you a baseline to start uh, identifying what those are and then begin to, then with that, you can start the planning process. Yep. So, yep, understanding that, I mean, from uh, how does that asset management uh, program really impact the financial process, the, the financial planning process? So when you're, when you're doing the planning, most corporations do their capital planning based upon a number of factors. Some will do it as a percentage of sales. Some will do it as a percentage of their total asset base. 
Some will do it just saying, oh, well, my asset, my asset value is $200 million. I'm going to just allocate 2.5% per year. Mm -hmm. So it's all over the place, and I think it's important for all of you to find out how capital, the master capital is allocated in the first place, and then find, be able from that point to find out what's the planning term. Most companies go anywhere from a year to five years. A few will do 10, but uh, realistically, three years is starting to become the norm. But I think from a facility perspective, you're going to own a building for potentially 50 years, or you may own it for five, right? That's another thing you need to figure out also. And then you know that the assets that you have and things you're maintaining are only going to last so long. So that can help you set up that master plan. Mm -hmm. Yep, cr critical. Um, before we get too far into this, I, I do uh, want to hit on something. Kevin and I will be accepting questions. Uh, we're going to welcome questions. So there is a spot to uh, enter those in uh, on your screen. Uh, so we're going to take those. We're going to uh, get a list going, and we're going to get to as many of those as possible at the end of the presentation. So please submit questions as they come up. Uh, Kevin, this is one of the things we talk, talked about. This is a, a study that, that we done on really two companies in a similar space, um, and I've got a good case study that I can send out, but uh, pretty much mirror image portfolios. Um, company A um, really had a strong long-range asset management program from the start. Uh, they used that to provide their financial team with the information that they needed to approve proper budgets and allow them to have a very proactive approach in managing their assets. Company B uh, very much so did not. They were reactive. They were running to expiration. They didn't have the information they needed to budget properly, get things approved. So we did a study of these, uh, and we found out that the investments uh, required were dramatically different. Uh, so from an overall company performance standpoint, I think this graphic here shows that um, there's tremendous financial impact in having a solid program, getting your budgets um, allocated properly, and then budgets effectively um, in a proactive facilities management approach. So, so having said that, I think we kind of get the importance now. Let's talk a little bit about how to develop an asset management program. Um, really four critical steps there uh, from my perspective. That you need to assess the overall conditions uh, and have an inventory of your assets. Uh, once you have that, you can really prioritize based on conditions and a couple of other key factors which we'll get into. Um, based on that, you're going to uh, develop some recommendations and, and solid budgetary plans uh, and ultimately an executable plan uh, for, for doing this. But really before you can get into the assessment, uh, I think this is important. You, you really need to determine your organization's overall mission and objectives. Um, Kevin, you talked a bit about this, how you might be in a facility for five years, you might be in a facility for 50 years. From a facilities management standpoint, um, how do you make sure that you're totally aligned with the overall organization's objectives? Well, one thing is to be aware of uh, what, what your company is in business for. Right? Your, business, your companies generally are not in business to own and maintain buildings. It's a nice place, nice things to have. So they're tipped in a, in a healthcare environment. Right? The mission is, uh, is healing people and manufacturing. It's uh, getting product out the door and, and driving profit for the shareholders. Uh, in, in the education, right? It's, provide, it's, it's really the educating of the students that uh, is at the core of their business, and the buildings are there to support that. Uh, at one point, I had a controller made a, make a comment to me, and you might guess who's controller manufacturing, that said, if I didn't have to have a building to protect my equipment and my product, I would be building in a field. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we have to have that understanding because if we're not making recommendations for our facility that really align with the old organization's objectives, it's, it's not going to be a fit from the start. Exactly. For sure. So when it comes to condition assessments, we'll just look at, a, at some examples. A facility condition assessment really needs to be comprehensive, complete, uh, objective. Uh, you want to look at deferred maintenance, uh, repairs required. Uh, design and construction issues up front, uh, we see that all the time. Uh, interesting, we, we're getting in, involved in projects that are failing that are less than five years old. Uh, they're having leaks, structural concerns. So we want to really look at those issues up front. Uh, life safety, code violations, and really any suggested improvements. Kevin, we talked about some of the teams uh, that, that should be required, that should support the assessments. I mean, it could be interior, for, um, I'm sorry, uh, in-house teams, you know, you, you might have specific expertise in-house that can support with that. Um, 
Uh, you might want to bring in a, a specialty consultant or engineering services provider that can help with these types of assessments, very, very specialized. Um, and so a number of things. I mean, anything you want to interject on uh, really teams that can help? No, I, I agree with you 100%. You know, we, as, as facility management professionals, construction professionals, you have a pretty good idea of what you need to get done. Um, you have contractors and, and supply partners that you know that can help you with budgets. But uh, what I found over the years is your expertise is great, but when it comes to evaluation beyond your manager, they're typically looking for more solid data. And when you can introduce a third-party study, an engineering study, a, uh, an assessment with recommendations to support what you're asking for, the, credib the credibility is increased two, three, four times. Right. Yep. Absolutely. So just looking at that process for uh, performing some condition assessments and um, purposes of this presentation, we're talking about roofs, building envelope, pavement, but this is applicable for, for anything that, that you're doing, whether it's interior or exterior. Um, the methods, the means, and procedures for evaluating those types of assets, and then really just the different types of solutions that, that we're looking at. So um, first, you know, you really want to perform that physical condition evaluation, the visual that's hands-on. Uh, you may want to do some materials testing, and you've got um, some masonry issues. Hey, let's open that wall up. Let's see what the condition of the lintels and the dual flashings are so we know what we're getting ourselves into uh, with the pavement geotechnical borings, what's the condition of the, of the sub base, the soils, the, the water table levels, et cetera. Uh, and then non-destructive testing like a structure scan infrared survey uh, or, or, or a tool to help assess, you know, um, uh, conditions that are not visible to the naked eye, right? So with roofs, um, you know, you can look at any type of roofing system. What you might be looking at, you know, from a condition assessment standpoint, we've got open laps, seams, Stained ceiling tiles, that's something very easy to detect. Uh, core analysis, a structure scan infrared survey to detect wet insulation. Uh, building envelope, you might be looking at masonry, uh, EFIS, metal, glass, wood. Depends, um, but again, you're looking at what are the conditions. Our buildings are always talking to us. Uh, we need to really assess them and, and listen to them because um, so we understand what we're, what we're getting into. You know, Nick, you make a really good point there because so much of the uh, high dollar expense replacement items are things that people don't see or overlook as they walk in the building. So roofs are rarely seen. People really don't look at masonry up close unless there's an obvious, like your picture on the lower left, a hole in it. Parking lots are kind of there, but you really hit on three of your probably most expensive replacement items mm -hmm. that are there in the building outside of HVAC. Yep. And so by doing these assessments and forecasting the life, big, the big thing you want to do is avoid surprising folks at an executive level with all of a sudden you've got a million dollar repair to make that wasn't even on their, on their radar screen. Yep. And if you can give them a heads up that says, hey, this is going to be need to be replaced in six years if we want to extend that to 10 years or 15 years, we need to do an intermediate step now, mm -hmm. right? So by building those and being able to project what's coming, then you're much more likely to get funding approved if you're giving them a heads up to one, two, three, five, ten 10 years in advance. Yep, yep, absolutely. Um, I guess there's a question building on that because I, I think it's important that I don't want to miss it. Um, how do you get buy-in to do those types of intermediate uh, actions, you know, whether to do the assessments proactively, whether the things are already deficient? Well, that really comes into building a business case for your request or, or saying here's an opportunity. I, I would like to put a positive spin on it. We have an opportunity. We're coming up to, the, to within a five- or six-year window on, on a, the end of life cycle of a piece of equipment mm -hmm. or, a, or part of the building or a structure. And the replacement cost in five years is going to be X number of dollars. However, we've identified a intermediate step that we can take now, or if we can do plan that for the next one to two years, we can defer that large expense for probably another four or five. Mm -hmm. So, and you take that to your manager. Now, all of a sudden, you're not just looking out to take care of what's what's standing right in front of you, but you're looking out in the future, and that's all part of understanding your assets, what's the life on them, and being proactive and saying it's not just what we need this year or next year. What's, what are the big ticket items coming up 
five, ten years, or maybe even longer down the road. Yep, yep, absolutely. Very good. Thank you. So, you know, once you perform the condition assessment of everything that, that Kevin and I had, had just talked about, and, and not only your roofs, your exterior walls, your, your pavement, it's really everything with, within, your serve, uh, within your facility. But once you have that, now we really start to prioritize, right, what's going to be important. And um, how we recommend doing that is a couple of ways. Number one is just the condition index rating, which we'll talk about and then the impact uh, to the business. So the condition index rating that we use, whether that's um, uh, RCI for roof condition index, uh, WCI for waterproofing condition index, or PCI for pavement condition index, we use a zero uh, to 100 um, uh, rating system. So easiest way for me to describe it, zero is failed, 100 is excellent. Right? Anything in the zero to 30 range is in rough shape. I mean, those are capital expenditures, those are beyond salvaging, uh, these 70s to 100s, they're in pretty good shape. I mean, those are opportunities for maintenance. Uh, and these 50s can be some real good opportunities that, that we'll get into on, uh, on deferred capital expenditures. So if you're doing a study of your assets um, and you can establish a condition index rating, it's a very interesting exercise to see from an overall executive standpoint. I mean, we looked at one here for a customer they had roughly 5 million square feet of roofing uh, on one of their campuses. And we looked, you know, what's, um, where are they at as a percentage, you know. Uh, with this one, they had about 25% of their asset that was in, in good shape and above. Um, about 35% is at that 50, so there might be some opportunities there. Um, a fair amount that just needed capital investment. So to have this executive snapshot of where your conditions are is going to help you allocate funding properly. Um, so like I said, just a visual, um, on the right here, zeros to 30s, those are major capital investments on our three-pronged approach. Uh, you're not going to want to invest a lot of maintenance into those. You know, operating dollars, not good investments into these zeros to 30s. Those are capital projects. Um, 70s to 100s, other end of the spectrum, right? Those are in good shape. Let's uh, invest into those. Let's do preventative maintenance programs. Let's max out on the service life of those assets. That's where you're going to want to put your, your funding allocation. These 50s, um, real good opportunities, Kevin, for what we call deferred capital expenditures or restoration. Um, maybe the exactly. easiest one for me to talk about is roofing. Hey, we've got a 20-year-old built-up roof. It's starting to see signs of aging. Um, if you can budget for this properly, you can perform a restorative action where you redo the flashing, you resaturate uh, the built-up roof, and you bring that 50 back up to your roof you get another 15, 20 years of life out of that. That's a huge impact. One thing uh, I want to add to the condition assessment that you were talking about earlier, uh, an infrared scan is great for identifying wet insulation, mm -hmm. and, and replacing insulation is the largest cost in a roof repair. Mm -hmm. So if you can identify where you have a leak and where it's beginning to get saturated, you can do a, you can do a repair of an area Whereas if you defer that, that's going to grow and the cost repair is going to go up exponentially. And that's where a report such as the, the type that Structure Tech has delivered uh, can really help you in terms of building that credibility and that plan to say, we have a repair that we would like to make. And they'll say, well, we can't afford that or we don't, don't really want to do that now. You can, you can say, under, you just say I, I understand that you know, we may not have capital, but if we wait another two to three years, cost is likely to double or triple as that insulation continues to get saturated. Yep, yep, that's huge. And again, it's kind of back to that business case that, that you're saying. So that's Absolutely. Very impactful. Um, so just again reiterating, you know, operations and maintenance projects might be maintenance, repairs, capital, we're looking at replacements and, and upgrades, uh, deferred capital expenditures, uh, could be restoration and then safety. Um, it can be its own category. I mean, safety repairs have to be urgent. Um, and you want to make sure those are very, very uh, high on the priority ranking. So one of the things that we talked about um, are really understanding what the organization's overall uh, objectives are and, and making sure that we're aligned with that. A big part of that is this facilities management uh, program and the categorization. So this is something that a number of clients um, national accounts that told us that they use, and really it's a category one through four. Um, and what that is is how you're going to invest in a facility. So a category one type facility 
is what you said, Kevin, a facility that you're going to be in long term. Uh, that's the world headquarters. You're going to be in there for 50 years. That's the high school. That's the flagship hospital in the portfolio. You're going to invest into those accordingly, right? Um, number two might be a medium range. Uh, you might plan to be in there for the next 20 years, but based on business conditions, where the markets are at that time, you might want to move. You might want to be in a different market, so you'll invest into those a different way. Um, short term, I mean, we're looking at five-year holds, um, and then we'll see what happens. We see this in healthcare all the time, um, where it's, hey, we want to build a replacement hospital. So we're going we're gonna to keep this for the next five years until we can build that replacement hospital, so we're not going to make significant investments in it. Uh, and then number four is divest from the portfolio immediately, mothball and sell. So I've, I'm assuming you, you use something similar in, in, in your past. You've seen it uh, in, in, a, in an office type of environment or in a... Um, to a manufacturing company, you're right, headquarters becomes a, a category one. Mm -hmm. But it's typically, if you have locations that have fewer employees or customers do not go to, so things like warehouses may end up dropping to a medium range investment, minimal maintenance, because the only one there are the people that are working there. Customers never go there. It's just a place to store materials until you can move it from spot from place A to place B. Yep. The challenge is, with a lot of those deferred maintenance, as many of you I'm sure have experienced, the longer you defer, the needs never go away. Yeah. And they start piling up until all of a sudden, you know, you're saying, hey, we're starting to have catastrophic failures that are impacting our operation. Yeah. And that's where understanding how to present, and we'll talk about a little bit more about that later, becomes, uh, becomes critical to being able to get funding that you need. Yeah, absolutely. So a question that I have on this, and, and a lot of people struggle with this, I have conversations like this every single day because we all understand the importance of being aligned with our organizations, you know, long term, where we're going to be. Um, some find it challenging to get, get this kind of information, though. So how have you been successful in understanding where, where you're at in Kellogg today and, and in your former life, hey, here's where we're going. I mean, this, this corporate headquarters is Category 1. And, this facility here is a category three. How, how, how are you getting that level of information and, and making others comfortable with giving you that? Really, it goes back to understanding, as you put, what's the mission of your company? Yep. Paying attention when that when the when the senior management has presentations to the to the group. Listen in. You may think, oh, that doesn't impact me, but the more you learn about what's going on in the company, and then you can tie what you do to the ability to get what they want to get done the more opportunity you have to get the funding that you need to, because now you're contributing to their business, right? It's not just a, a necessary evil. Yep, perfect. Thank you. So, Kevin, on, on really planning capital budgets, you, you provided a, a pretty interesting tool here. Yeah, and that's, there's, as we look at our FM, I'll call it FM projects or even capital projects, uh, we developed a, um, a weighting matrix very similar to what you've done in, in, what your, uh, in your condition assessments. But there's a couple of other things that we add to it. Um, we have things like safety, security, and risk. And we've defined a couple of different levels, and we put a ranking to it. Um, if, you, if you can see up at the top, you say assigned ranking weight. We have six different criteria that we worked at. Safety, security, and risk is one. Um, our time reading it. Open uh, op oh, operational impact. So what happens to the operation when you do something or when you don't some, do something? Then we have what's the cost of it, because obviously that has an impact too. If it's something is a $100 repair, you just, you just do it. But if it's a million dollars, it takes a little bit more planning and, uh, and uh, frankly, time to get it approved. Uh, is it employee facing? We talked about in a facility where you have employees or customers in, or is it not? So what's the impact? Um, the other is what is the impact? So is it, when you do the repair, is it disruptive? Are people going to have to move? Um, so that goes in, that goes, that's a factor as well. And then finally, um, the impact to other strategies that you have. So if you, if you address one thing, how does it impact something else? So that's, that's kind of the way to, and we put that together to come up with a weighting scale. So as we're trying to decide well, how do we prioritize the projects, you now have a data-driven tool to go do that, and the good thing about it was with the weighting, depending on your organization or the building you have, you can change the weighting based upon what's important for the purpose of that specific building. 
Okay. So we developed this tool as a means to help us so that when we take our exhaustive list of projects that we want to get done and sit down with the managers, we have a, a rating scale that says, here's how we prioritize based on these, these criteria. So then you can begin to have a conversation. And now you get help in prioritizing and understanding so that when your boss or their boss has to take it to someone who has no clue what this is about, now once again, you talked about the support of an engineering study bringing credibility. Now you actually have a ranking scale that says out of all of these, we feel these are the most critical and this is why. Yep. Okay, good. And now, um, do all of your projects run through this? Is it a, your significant projects? Uh, we run all of our, I'll call it our, the projects that we have to do out of our maintenance budget, okay. where we have a, a limited amount of funds. We have so much allocated for doing projects. That's how we prioritize. I'm sure many of you run into some things that say, ah, sorry, you can't get the money till next year, or I've got to plan it two years out. Mm -hmm. Well, that, again, that's when it comes down to understanding what's the impact. Because if you can say, I have a high impact, if this what's the consequence of failure? We'll get into that when we talk more about capital approval. Mm -hmm. But consequence of failure is very important to be able to talk to. And it's not, it looks bad, it's, it, it's, a, it's a safety issue, it impacts the ability for employees to get work done, it, it, it impacts the ability for students to learn, for patients to heal. Now all of a sudden you're talking their language and the level of importance increases. Yep. So, um, Kevin, could you expand a little bit more on, you know, the FM budgets and, and capital planning? And yeah, realistically, uh, facility management budgets and capital, uh, facility capital go hand in hand. Um, if you're providing, if you're doing maintenance on a regular basis, you're going to require capital really when something's at end of life. And if you've gotten proper funding for maintenance, you can extend the normal life on something by several years. It's when your budgets get cut, you can't do the maintenance you need, repairs get deferred, when all of a sudden you go from a repair to a replace. Um, I would, I would suggest if you don't know the criteria for capital, you ask, uh, because most organizations have a pretty defined uh, method of identifying what's capital and what's expense, or what's capital expense versus maintenance expense. And once you understand what that criteria is, that will help you provide input to a capital plan, which may be out of your control. But if you, again, if you can start forecasting, I'm going to need to replace it. End of life is at 10 years. I'm at 12 currently because we've done, done a good job of maintaining it. But what's going to happen is it's going to fail. If it fails, this is what, this is the impact. And something as simple as if it fails, I can't get one for 12 weeks. That's the lead time. So if I'm not proactive in, in replacing it before we have the failures, or I'm going to have a, a massive repair, that's going to take another extended period of time. And that's where that waiting matrix that we talked about comes into play. Yeah. So it's really understanding what am I able to maintain out of my FM budget by having a planned maintenance program and, and certain amount of repairs. And as your, as your assets get older that, and you have that data, that's a good way to ask for additional, uh, additional uh, maintenance funds. And then when you're at end of life, that's a great way to support your request for capital. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, at what point do you get purchasing finance and accounting involved in your planning process? Um, I try to provide quarterly updates. Okay. Typically, most department managers will be required to report out on budgets and progress, sometimes monthly, but quarterly, I think quarterly or semi-annually, they're looking for kind of a sub uh, uh, a summary of what's been going on and more likely a forecast of how much are you going to, to spend. Are you under budget? Are you over budget? If you're over budget, they say, hey, you've got to be back in budget by the end of the year, and now you're, you're forced into making decisions on what you're going to cut, or you have to justify, I really need to do these, and that's, again, where this asset management program comes into play by having that data. But realistically, you need to develop a relationship somewhere within your FM organization with capital planning folks, with finance, with real estate. If, if they're making decisions on long-term uh, plans for buildings, they may not tell you, but they can, you know, you can get a hint that say, we're going to push off that for a while. Um, and, and really, communications is in there. 
and I bring that uh, up because most people don't think about it. You, most organizations have some kind of communications organization, but every time you do a project that's going to cause some kind of disruption, the best thing you can do is communicate to people ahead of time, we're going to be doing this, Here's what, the, here's what the, in, the inconvenience is going to be, or here's how long it is planned to be for, and let them know ahead of time. Because that way, two things, they can either, you, you let people know, so they say, oh yeah, I forgot about that, oh, I'm going to have to take the stairs for a while because my, my elevator is going to be down for maintenance. Or you can get directions from management that says, you better do that after hours or on weekends, so that way you can budget and plan accordingly. Mm -hmm. yep. Perfect, yeah. I think your point, communications is you. We just did a, a significant parking garage restoration program for a customer, and, and obviously you you know how disruptive that can be uh, for, for employees and visitors and all that. And, and the communications of it was one of the most important parts to make sure everyone knew and what was expected, what um, the duration and all that. So I think that's very, very Especially important. Especially if you're in one of those priority one buildings. Yeah, exactly. We re recently implemented a process that uh, any work causing disruption, we have to have a minimum of 48 hours notice ahead of time. So a lot of times if you're ha on a construction project or there's another project you have going, someone says, hey, oh, by the way, we're going to be doing some hammer drilling tomorrow. And trust me, you need to ask those questions of your contractors rather than discover them after you get a call screening. What's going on? You know, I didn't know about this. I've got a big meeting. I have a webinar I'm doing and I can't hear. Yeah. Those types of things. Yep, exactly. Perfect. So, um, you know, we have that solid plan. We understand capital versus expense. We're uh, starting to formulate all that. Now, how do we estimate those budgets really accurately? So uh, it really needs to be based on the scope of work, right, um, very specifically. I mean, uh, a roof, you could have a 10-year roof. You could have a 40-year roof. Um, they're not the same cost. So what meets your objectives? What do you want to get done? And how can you budget for that very specifically? Um, might include some alternate procedures. Right, so we can do this or that, what's going to be the best solution for us, and you should have a cost of both, and then an impact of both. What's the value of doing either option? Uh, and sometimes it's very helpful that unit pricing estimates uh, based on, on current average pricing information. Right. And so when you have the opportunity to use uh, professional organizations such as Structure Check, Structure Tech, where, you, where they're providing those kind of budgets and information back to you, um, often you don't have the money to go out and get a bunch of studies done, but you do have preferred partners that you work with, whether they're contractors, existing suppliers, uh, or people that can just help you on general budgeting. Give me a bigger than a bread basket so at least you can start putting things in that long-term plan by having budgetary costs, and then you can say, right now we're budgeting a half a million dollars for a, for a repair, what I'd really like to do is go get a professional study done. The cost of that's going to be $25,000. Can I get the $25,000 to do the study to make sure that I have the correct scope, that we have the right budget, and if there is an alternative, they can bring that to us. Mm -hmm. If you go to them with that kind of information, you're much more likely to get the $25,000 than just walking in saying, hey, I want to get a study done on my parking lot. Yeah, exactly. So when it comes to um, you know pricing, scheduling data, some of the ways that we've seen it done is using historical data. So here's where it was last year. It might be similar. You know you might want to include some some uh, inflation. Um, to your point, Kevin, you know local contractors, existing vendor relationships, getting some you know um, ballpark pricing there, using a specialty consultant. Uh, to your point, um, and it needs to reflect the matter uh, within the within the work. Do you have other other things like RS means? estimating guides that you can go to. Yeah. But I think it's important that, that uh, if, you're, if you're having a difficult time getting the money for studies or engineering, it's good to go to, again, any of those sources to say what could it be. And then, again, your management, you can go to them and say, I would really rather spend a little now to really identify what, what it is, see if there's something else we can do, because this is, the, this is what the potential impact is going to be. I know we don't have it in our budget this year, and if you're in at this time of year in September, some companies the the 2020 budget's already set. Mm -hmm. So now you're looking at a year and a half delay, and again added cost. Yep. Yeah. So what what you said is pretty powerful, and it, and it's fresh for me right now because I have a, a customer who is just very successful in this. He's been struggling with getting things approved and and funded over the past probably four years or so. He's wanted to do a, a fair amount of roofing. 
developed a budget. Um, it was a seven hundred thousand dollar project over a over a hospital that that they have, and presented that to leadership, and then used that exact same strategy. Yeah, the budget seven hundred thousand, but now we need to really dig deeper, tighten this up, see what all the all the options are, and they're bringing us in now to do a more in-depth study and, and make sure that everything's being done properly. So it's a really good strategy, so I'm happy yeah. about that. Yeah. And the other thing is that, that a lot of times when you get to higher dollar amount, their purchasing gets involved. They want to have competitive bids. Mm -hmm. And uh, my only advice is if you, ha if you can get someone to write plans and specifications for you rather than doing it yourself, um, I think you'll save yourself a lot of grief. Uh, sometimes, you know, you may have had a previous specification. You can reuse that. And if it's something that's, that the impact is not huge, that may work for you. But uh, if someone's already done a study for you, the cost of them to come out and refresh that is a fraction of the original cost. And I'd encourage you, you know, if you're being pushed for plans and spec work, which I suspect you will, especially on larger projects, that you're going to need those kind of things done. Yeah. well ahead of time and you should plan to have that extra time when you get that done. Yeah, yeah. Um, good. So obviously we understand the capital planning process is huge. Um, Kevin, you talked a little bit on the bottom bullet point, you know, we're looking at five, ten-year budgets. Three seems to be a, a standard that things are moving towards now. So you really have those long-term budgets and then more of your short-term, you know, maybe one-year uh, urgent type request too. And, and we got feedback from another client that I want to share on that later. Um, so, Kevin, you, you laid out really what a typical capital request, you know, template looks like. Once we have this plan, how are we going in to structure our, our request? Yeah, so for those of you that are, that are that do capital planning and, and write capital requests, this will look very familiar to you. For those that don't, I just want to give you an idea of justification. This same process can be used for your facilities projects also where you want to just get additional maintenance expense. But typically you have to present the situation, and that is – you know, you may have had something fail, and it's at the end of life, and or you can't get parts for it, and it needs to be replaced. The project objective, I want to make this very clear, is not to replace the equipment. This is the one where you have to translate what you want to do into describing how it's going to impact the organization. So if you have a piece of HVAC equipment, it's to ensure you have a, you have a comfortable, productive, workplace for your employees. Uh, you need to be able to provide heat and, and cool weather. Um, and you want to get something done now in the, in, in the fall, you want to start planning and getting something done to get your air conditioning uh, fixed or replaced during the, the shoulder months or during the winter mm -hmm. so that it's ready to go for the seasons ahead. Um, so that's where that, uh, the impact and tying that back to your organizational uh, objectives become pretty important. Right. Safety, or, you know, things like safety, uh, comfort, uh, sustainability. You can have uh, energy savings. You can have technology improvement. Those are the things that you want, the verbiage you want to use in your, uh, in your objective. Again, tie them to the core values of, of what your business is. That's why I suggest that you listen to some of those presentations. Because if you can put it in their language, then they'll understand why you're doing it. People don't know what a built-up roof means. They don't know what a parapet is. They don't know what certain levels, certain qualities of asphalt, or why it's important, why you can do a grinding, or why you got to. They don't know, and frankly, they don't care. Yep. But it's it's going to give you 10 more years of extended life. It will last 25 years. Those are the things that you want to put in the in the in the uh, in your objective. The justification comes down to, is it at end of life? Can it no longer be repaired? Is it a major repair to offset a, long, a larger cost of replacement? Um, what's the impact to the organization, right? If we don't do this now, it's going to require a later. Uh, by doing it now, we minimize disruption. We can get this work done in a four-week span rather than a 12-week than a project. Sustainability is becoming pretty important for most organizations. And a lot of people don't pay much attention to it. Your energy savings, if you've got those projects, can go in here. If you can translate dollars or kilowatt hours or 1,000 foot of gas into greenhouse gas emission impact, 
That is what the CFO, the CEO are looking at in their sustainability reports. And somebody in engineering, somebody in your dream can help you make that transition. You can probably even Google calculators online to help you with that. Um, if you're replacing HVAC, you're going to go to a newer, more environmentally friendly you know, refrigerant. If you're going to um, make a major re uh, mortar replacement, you're going to, through that process, extend the life of the asset another 10 or 15 years. That's the kind of thing that, even though you're doing it for those other reasons, if you can plug it into sustainability, you get more points on their rating scale in terms of how do they prioritize. Exactly, and, and I think that's why sustainability is such a uh, critical piece of that. And oftentimes when I talk about it with, with our customers, it's, it's not always that green technology or, or like the greenhouse gas type thing that you mentioned, and that's a huge part of it, but it's also sustaining the life of your existing assets. And your masonry example was huge. Hey, I mean, this building's designed the last 40 years. I mean, let's get 40, let's get 50, let's max out on the service life of these assets. Let's be sustainable with the resources that, that we're responsible for maintaining. So I think that's huge. I've, been, I've even had comments from people reviewing these saying, wow, hardly anybody ever, ever, ever fills these out. Yeah. And then typically if you have a, sustain, a sustainability off, uh, person in the organization, if you get to know them, you can, you can find that they can, they can find money almost magically if, if at a very high level they need to report additional activities and it's important to their shareholders that they do that. Yeah, perfect. Cool. Then the other key risks and key issues, risks and assumption, key issues may be the work has to be done on nights and weekends. Um, it has to be approved by such and such a date in order to get it done before the weather closes you out. Um, the risk could be if you don't do it and you have to defer it or if it fails, you can't get that, you can't get a piece of equipment for installed for 12 weeks. You may have to move out of your building. Um, try not to overstate, but if it's a reality that you may have to vacate a build, building because it doesn't meet code, put it in there. You'll find, you'll find the things that fall under code, just code things, tend to get approved right at the top of the list. Uh, for, for example, in Kellogg, because we're a food manufacturing company, if it has an impact on food safety, it rises to the top of the list. So that's where you tie what you're doing into the organizational objectives, and that helps you a great deal in getting it done. Another area that, that's often not filled out too much in alternatives evaluated is, is this, thing, is, is this the only thing you looked at? Because a lot of times they'll say, there's got to be something else you can do, and they'll kick it back, and you'll be starting over again. Obviously, and you should list this, do nothing is an alternative, right? There's a consequence with that, and that's what needs to be in there. We looked at that. We rejected it because of all the reasons up above. We looked at replacing it in kind. We looked at replacing it at a lower cost. We looked at a temporary solution, and temporary solution is 100000 Long-term solution is $700,000. we are recommending the $100,000 because we can defer the major expense for another six years. Right. right? It's all your objective, and that's where this becomes uh, very important. Scope of work summary gets you back to what are we going to do to get the result. An executive summary is just very high level, and you want to touch on many of the things up above. Shouldn't be overly lengthy, but your objective really is what you're trying to accomplish for the organization. What are you going to do? What's the duration? Yep. What's the cost? Right. Very good. Then you built a good topic, and if you use this even on your FM reports, you'll find that you're going to start carrying more credibility as you're actually competing for money, which you are, with other priorities of the organization. Yep. I don't know if everyone realized they were coming to a uh, uh, how to sell facilities budgets thing, though. So this is, I mean, this is good. I mean, this is our tried and proven strategies because you've been very, very successful at this. So um, I, I think this is very impactful. So thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, kind of continuing on, Kevin here, you, you've got um, the financial information, you know, other requirements, anything you want to hit on there? Otherwise, you may have to provide the other requirements or attachments, asset transfers or dispositions. Yeah. You may say, what's that? So if, let's say, you're you're, you're, restruct, you're going to repurpose an area. You're taking things out of it to make it used for something else. Mm -hmm. What are you taking out that either has to be scrapped or can you use it someplace else? And that's good, too. And that's where you can get with you. You have, you have, you have part of your financial organization that deals with that. I would say go to them and say, hey, we're taking this stuff out. What do you need to know? 
Yeah. Because that may have only been depreciated for five years on a 10-year life, and they've got to write off the other five years. So that's something the financial people need to know about. Mm -hmm. um, financial analysis, that's if there's a payback involved. You may be asked to do a cash flow. Those are things that your financial partners can help you with if you don't know. You could ask for the template, and you can provide the information that you have. If there's deferred maintenance expense, that goes into a savings. If there's any energy savings, if there's uh, other cost alternatives, you want to provide that information. And then copies of engineering studies, copies of any quotations to support your request for the dollars. Great. So everything we've talked about right now, I like to um, equate as a roadmap. So you've got a, a good solid asset management plan. That should really say, okay, here's where we're currently at as an organization, and here's where we need to go over the next you know, one, three, five, ten years to um, to make sure that we're operating in our facilities very effectively, whether to your point it's to support the manufacturing process, to help with the education process, uh, maintaining a, a solid healthcare environment, but it's it's here's where we're at and here's what we need to do to, to maintain those and, and reach our, our ultimate objective. So just an example here that, that we will um, speed through as, as we are running short on time and, and we have some really good questions, but you know, what, a, what does an asset management plan look like, Kevin? And, and I know that you've used these very, very successfully, but some of these executive level reports for what your assets are currently comprised of, overall condition index uh, ratings and, and analysis, uh, recommendations per asset. So this one we're talking about roofs, you know, so on a typical complex, you might have 200 roofs. What do you need to do? Um, for each roof area and each facility within the portfolio and, and try to put time frames on that. Exactly. And then once you have that, budgeting. I mean, budgeting is, is critical. That's, that's taken up a, a good portion of our dialogue. But, you know, looking at the uh, approaches, any alternative procedures and having a solid budgetary plan for this year and really the next five years. And, and you can stretch that or, or shrink that time frame, but it, it's important to look at both short and long term. So just tools that will really help to streamline this process here. Uh, and, then, and then the backup information. This is going to be this is going to be a key supporting element to it. So you know here's how we got to these budgets and, and these recommendations. This is an example roof asset management plan where you're looking at okay overview information, actual condition analysis information. Um, for everything within the roof system, and then ultimately those recommendations again. Uh, and you're going to want to follow it up with pictures. I, I think, Kevin, I think you'd probably agree, um, and, and you, you said this, the financial executives don't know what a built-up roof is. They don't care what a built-up roof is. But if you can come at them with photographs that show, hey, this roof is clearly not in good shape, or these masonry walls are deficient, um, I do think that does help to sell the case. I don't want to drag it out too long, but I'll tell you one story that, that I personally used. We had a roof that was totally saturated, and actually the, um, the, um, the purlins were starting to bend mm -hmm. on there, and I actually had to go to the vice president who just didn't want to spend it, and I took two, bear, two pla black plastic bags, one carrying a piece of, of roofing with dry insulation and the, and the roof, one foot square, another one foot square of the saturated roof, and I handed them to him, and I said, and your left hand is what you should be, and your right hand is what you have. Yeah. That sitting on top of that roof, which is not designed to handle that much weight, when we get another winter like last winter, where we have a lot of wet snow on the roof and you get a freeze, that roof's coming down. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm standing here. I'm so adamant because it, it, is, it is a safety issue. It shuts down production. It impacts your customers. It impacts your business. And I want to make, make sure you understand that this, this is why I'm very respectfully asking that this be prioritized. Yep. And it was impactful. Yeah. It was impactful because he wasn't going to go out and look, didn't want to listen to it because he's dealing with the numbers. He's got production things that they're dealing with. But that's just what's going Huge. Thank you. Um, and then as we start to close, um, tracking performance. This is one of the things we talked about as Kevin, you and I were, were planning for this, is how do you track performance and then how do you utilize that tracking to, um, to get even more budget approved, to really justify what you've been doing. This is an example that we've looked at uh, for a number of customers, but 
if we're looking at uh, condition index rating here, you know, year one, what did that look like? And then as budgets start getting approved, as projects start taking place as part of this long-range asset management program, um, after five years, what do these condition index ratings look like? And that's, that's huge. Take that report card back and say, okay, here's where we were. Based on all these investments, these strategic things that we've been doing, here's where we're currently at. And then the impact for the organization. Okay. Um, so we appreciate uh, Kevin, you sharing, and, and also we've, we've got uh, some other input from, from some others. So um, other customers that, that we have just wanted to share, this is a hot topic. I think everyone's struggling with this. Uh, so we heard from one of the key uh, engineering and project management leaders for Healthcare uh, Corporation of America. They operate um, north of, I think, 200 hospitals uh, across the country. Very, very um, uh, high-end healthcare system, doing really, really well. And what she had described to me uh, yesterday is that of those 200 hospitals, um, what's happened is that the facilities management and project management side of the business is allocated a large amount of money, um, or a fixed amount of money. Um, so they're given that amount of money for the year, and they're really uh, given monthly spending objectives for cash flow purposes. So it's really important for them to have the uh, right projects identified and also ready to go to, to meet those. So what they do is the individual sites for, uh, submit requests, and then at a corporate level, those projects are reviewed and prioritized based on risk and return on investment potential from a facility standpoint. Um, to further support that, what they did very impactfully is they uh, implemented a system-wide five-year program um, strategically for proactive items, and then they have a fund still for urgent um, or more reactive items that, that's been developed. So what she had described to me is that utilizing these tools has helped ensure that their funding is used um, on the highest impact items, highest impact projects, and that their capital spending objectives are met. So I thought that was unique, having 200 facilities all dealing with one pot of money and, and how those things are prioritized, and how she and her team were able to utilize an asset management plan to be really effective in the budget allocation process. The other thing that does for them by having that list yeah. is that if capital becomes available at the end of the year, perhaps something got canceled, that list is ready to go, and then the question is going to be, can you get it executed by the end of the year? Yep. Yep, exactly. So I would, I would keep a list of those things in your back pocket. So should that come up, you can say, yep, I can spend it. Here's what I'm going to spend it on. And if you have that kind of planning, your, your opportunity to get that funds is higher than someone who hasn't done that. Yep, exactly. That's huge. And then just the last one that I want to hit on here before we get to, uh, get to some of these questions. Um, this is a high-end, world-renowned pharmaceutical organization. Um, uh, well, roughly 100 facilities across the U.S. and, and uh, multiple more across the world. And, and they had a very reactive approach to facilities management where it was similar to a lot. Um, as problems would arise, that's when they'd start to go to the finance people and start asking for the money. And by that point, it was, it was kind of late and really hard to secure that funding because it was all already allocated to business needs, right? New line, new yep. equipment, operating the business. So um, that was a challenge for a number of years. Um, Throughout their process of transforming to a, to a proactive approach, one of the areas they wanted to focus on was roofing. They came to us and, and we helped them in developing a, an assessment plan for all the roofs, pavements, parking uh, assets, things of that nature. But what they did is they developed a, a five-year needs assessment, uh, laid out what they need, um, to your point, why it's important for the business to, to maintain these assets. Uh, but the neat thing is they were able to submit these to the CFO, work really closely with them, um, show that why they're doing these projects is important, and then showing value. Um, so they were really successful in getting budgets, but they're at a point now um, that the CFO is really coming to them first because they know they have their needs really, really tight. They know that if they allocate a million dollars to this facilities group, it's going to be invested properly because they know what they need. So they're a real key part of that part of that team with the CFO and even probably the CEO, and, and they're really being come to first. So I thought that was pretty powerful to hear that they're a real part of that financial. Real life. Yep, yep, exactly. So, you know, in conclusion, having a, a asset management plan really simplifies the planning process. You optimize operational performance. 
Uh, it minimizes the overall total cost of ownership and supports the organization's corporate goals, right? So, Kevin, this was top-notch. I appreciate you sharing all of this. Um, obviously, you've been really successful at this. We've talked a lot about your case studies, your, your war stories, but what you've been able to do in your role um, is pretty impactful, and, and obviously we appreciate you sharing with, with us and, and all the attendees. So thank you so much for that. And thank you. As you can tell, this is, uh, I'm pretty passionate about this, uh, this process and the planning process here because that, that will that will help facilities raise the val raise their value in the organization. Absolutely. So having said that, let's open up the, the floor for some questions here. Um, um, so um, Kevin, this is one I, that I'll kind of put in your core. What's the best way to defend the cost of assessment and who typically would pay for that? Is that the site? Um, that corporate, how, how have you seen that? Um, well, typically, um, I can tell you that right now, uh, the process that we have is that if, a, if, a, if an assessment is going to lead to a project, so let's say you've got money project, you know, that situation we talked about, you have a $700,000 project, you want 25000 to do it, they create what's called, an, we create what's called an enabling capital request. So we're asking to spend the 25000 to validate and justify the larger amount. Mm -hmm. So that gets appropriated through a capital process that comes out of corporate down through the organization. Okay. If you don't, sometimes we're, we're just, we have to eat it out of maintenance. Or what we really do is we build the case that say, we have all these assets, we're approaching end of life, we really need to have an engineering assessment or have an engineering assessment to, to plan for that and make the request, uh, like a, a special request that they start allocating uh, engineering funds for engineering and studies, and why, you're probably not gonna give it the same year you ask, but if you, if you prime that pump, the next, the next financial cycle, you may, you know, you prioritize those studies, you're likely to start getting some of that money. Okay, good, thank you. Um, next, we'll hit on this one. So do we have any feedback on contractors that provide these assessments? Uh, as an example, roofing. Um, so I can, I'll start that, and then Kevin, if you want to interject, um, uh, we'd welcome that. But um, I think what we had alluded to is that you want an expert, right? You want an expert that understands the asset, whether that's roofing, mechanical, building envelope, et cetera. You want someone that really understands the technologies, the options, the solutions. Um, I am going to key in on, on one part of this, uh, the, the contractor part, is that um, sometimes contractors aren't always unbiased, right? They're looking for, for things. So, my recommendation would be to really make sure that whoever you're using, whether that's a consultant, a contractor, uh, one of your in-house technicians, that they're unbiased, really looking out solely for the best interest of the organization, your assets, and, and really is an expert. Right. And, the, and the, the important thing there is there are some contractors who only do one type of solution, and it's important to get someone that does multiples and knows the difference and can make that recommendation and you use them for budgetary purposes. But I, again, I can't reinforce more, especially on roofing. Having a professional assessment or a consultant do that will carry far more credibility than your local contractor will, yep. and regardless of how good they are. Yep. This one's huge. Uh, so I want to hit on this, and, and you told the story of it. So in a manufacturing environment, facilities are always competing for capital dollars with manufacturing investments. How can facilities get the money we need? I mean, with that understanding that um, some of the folks you, you've worked with in your past would operate in a cornfield if they could. If they didn't need a roof yeah. or a wall, they wouldn't do it. So Again, do that. that's when that consequence of failure becomes in there and projecting the life of an asset. Um, one of the things that I had to do when I first got to Kellogg about four years ago, they were, only get, they were getting less than a million dollars a year in capital. Um, my capital budget this year is going to be closer to $17 million. And part of it is saying, I've got a 35-year-old building. I don't have one. I've got six of them. 35 years old is typically the peak of end of life. All your five-year stuff hits a cycle. All your 10-year stuff hits a cycle. All your 15-year stuff hits a cycle. And all your 30-year things hit the cycle. And if you've deferred maintenance, you've just built up a mountain of deferred costs. And that's information that you can get from professional organizations like IFMA, FOMA, facility management technologies, any a number of things. That's, that's general data that I think makes sense to folks. And then um, what's the consequence of failure? 
So for example, if you have a parking structure that the concrete's deteriorating, the steel's deteriorating, you're having sections fall down, photos and the fact that you can now endanger people and lives, and the other thing about what's the cost of doing it now versus later, that becomes very critical. That's where it's important that you start prioritizing and having those factors listed and a weighting scale that, that it's, it's not you, the chicken little story, but it's data driven, here's the priorities, here's the consequences, here's the alternatives, here's how we can expand, but at a minimum we need to get the professional assessment done. Yep, huge. Thank you. Um, and then, uh, Agreed. And I, I think another thing that we also find is that we understand these are profit centers too, right? These, sometimes these individual plants are seen as profit centers. So, so, so the short answer to the NPV question yeah. is if, if, if you're competing for capital, if you, have, if you have a project that's based upon a payback, an energy project, a cost avoidance, uh, some corporations will rank their investment based on the higher the NPV or the higher the return on investment the more likely it is to get capital. And that's why that piece is important. The other thing that they use it for is making the determination, do you pay for it do you or do you finance it or do you lease it? So that's when it goes to corporate treasury and they start making those decisions that say, yes, we want to capitalize this or hey, can we go to somebody who is going to finance this for us? Can we do a performance contract? Right? Challenges in manufacturing or any profit-making organization with a performance contract is they always make the decision on whether to invest based on return on investment and NPV before how. So the how can get you a positive cash flow. It's convincing them for long-term assets that they really need to look at it differently, and that's when you're really going to have to partner close with your financial partners and explain the value of those types of offerings. Yep. Good. Okay. Um, I guess a couple closing questions. There's still some that, that I don't think we're going to have time to get to, but uh, Kevin, we have a request here. If we could please distribute a sample request template as a follow-up to this program. Um, so the things that you found in the slides with some aid are exactly from our capital investment criteria. Okay. I would suggest that you go to your own organization and ask them, do you have a capital, a financial pro forma that you use that we, I would need to help fill out or work with them to be able to get this data to you, the financial side of it. Yep, perfect. Um, I think just you having the knowledge to know that something should exist and you're asking for that lends credibility yep. and also say we're trying to prioritize the investments for the organization and have the greatest impact. Okay, very good. Uh, and also to support that, um, I can help in distributing some things that we've used in the past to, to support customers and, and then to Kevin's point customize that for your organization. What's important to your organization, customize it because that's where you're going to have the best success. Um, so really in closing, um, I, we just appreciate everyone joining on. This is a very timely topic. Uh, Kevin, appreciate your expertise and, and the willingness to, to share with us. I think this is very impactful and you've clearly been very successful in, in what you're doing. So I appreciate that. And to see Nick O'Hare from Kellogg is still on the line. Nick, feel free to uh, look for me on Skype next week and give me a ping and we can talk further. Perfect. So any other questions, comments, please, uh, please get back to us um, and we'll help in any way that we can. But best of success uh, for your remaining 2019. Um, good luck in planning your 2020 budget. Uh, and have a great rest of the year. More importantly, 21 through 20 through 25. <laughs> good point. Have a great day. Thank you.